trying to find out how to. So, there's something about sadness that takes everybody very deep into themselves. It actually takes you quite close to that place that Robert utilizes to show you who you really are as nothingness. But when it comes to the totality of enlightenment, You have to know that there are two different kinds, very different. There's the shock, the awakening, which is the epitome of the experiences of consciousness. It's when you experience the life force inside of you with such intensity, such bliss, such power of consciousness, so much energy, you feel on top of the world. And you just want to walk around crying out, I have come alive. I encourage people to try to get this kind of awakening first because it helps so much in getting the non-Shakti awakenings. It buffers you from kind of isolation that the nothingness kinds of awakenings can bring to you if you don't have that already, that calmness and acquaintance with the life force that the Shakti gives you. Now, Muktananda highly emphasized the Shakti style of awakening, blue pearls and all that stuff are phenomena. Our joy within the phenomena. It's your friendship with the life force and consciousness. It's an exaltation and the epitome of being alive. There's nothing else like it. Sometimes people have tried to compare it to the sex act, but there's no similarity whatsoever. The stretching that awakening to the life force brings to you, which I call an awakening to God within, because it's probably what the experience that most people that say they've known God have experienced. It's filled with light and energy and the movements of energies inside and the appearance of light 
and other colors that make you feel more alive than ever before. And usually, if not always, are preceded by a long period of devotion and surrender to someone or something, whether it's a guru, a lover, a partner, an animal maybe like a collie. It's the epitome of being alive. It's feeling God within. And that in a sense, you're a splinter of that God force. God and you are one. But you're se separate. You're split off. God lives in you and through you. And you're that splinter that watches and is part of the show which God is putting on through you. But you're not the main thingamajig. God is the life force is. It's playing through your life, through your body, through your mind. And you're more or less just going along for the ride. <coughs> and if you're smart, you just shut up and go along with the ride. It's much easier that way than to fight at every turn for it to be different, which means You've lost your will to be in charge. And you welcome whatever comes up. You go along with the play. Because it's a divine show with a billion different shows going on in and around the world that combine to make up life as we know it. There's the small shows of all the insects that live in and around your house. The animals outside, rabbits and coyotes, foxes, raccoons, possum, and all the worms and birds each have that life force in them also. The birds sing about it, how great it is. The trees make sounds, not of their life force, but of the winds blowing through its branches. And we can learn to rejoice in the life all around us of which we are a part. But then again, This kind of awakening after a while gradually returns into something like the mundane world. Not that you ever really go back into being what you were before your awakening, but the magic of it seems to gradually dissipate. 
all the myriad of forces inside of you, which you were keenly aware of months or years before, gradually subside. You no longer feel the love of God as before, but you're happy. You're happy. You're at ease. You're no longer striving for anything in life. You're there to take whatever is offered. No matter how troublesome or how calm and loving. And you're the life force is still there within you and it's alive and you're, you're aware of it. And you're aware of the majesty of the life force within you. But something has been taken away. It's kind of ebullience that happens with the first awakening to God within. When you first awaken and you feel those energies within you circulating, coming and going, seemingly offering telepathic communication with your partners or with the life forces around you. It's a time of magic and wonder. But after a while, it sort of calms down. The magic sort of disappears. It's there, but it's no longer at the forefront. It's there as your body, as your mind but not in a constant celebratory fashion of loudly shouting, I am alive. It's just an awareness that you're no longer of the mundane world, the work-a-day world. You couldn't care less about the work-a-day world. You couldn't care less about a job that you have. You go through it, but so what? But you're at ease and you're at rest. It's just that all of that spectacular fireworks are no longer there. And then either consciously as a quest or unconsciously as an enfoldment, the downward movement of your spirituality takes you eventually into nothingness. Now, the Buddhists talk about this, the flaming out of the life force, the flaming out of the self, the disappearance of self into peace. And you'll find all around you that there are people that have been pursuing this kind of awakening even while you were shouting about how wonderful it was to be alive and embodied. Now you're aware that others are around you saying how wonderful it is to not have a body, to not be conscious, to not be aware.
and maybe you've never tasted of the awakening to God consciousness and all the time you've been pursuing the experience of nothingness. What is it like? Well, it's not like a snuffing out of God or God consciousness. It's something quite different. It's becoming aware of the fact that you're not a physical entity, a body. It has God consciousness inside. But it becomes an awareness that what you really are is not the body or identification with the body. But what you really are is consciousness. It's knowledge, so to speak. All that you're ever aware of is consciousness. So all that you're aware of at this phase of your understanding and unfoldment is consciousness itself. So you can say your awareness, but sometimes that gets confused with consciousness and it also gets confused with where our attention are, is. We can be aware of the whole world simultaneously in some kinds of samadhis. What Robert called the Brahman state, where you're one with all of phenomenal existence. But when you begin localizing your attention, various aspects of the totality of reality. The totality begins breaking up into objects like your body, your house, your mother, your father, other people. And you begin living in a multiplex existence of hundreds of thousands of objects, some of which are sentient and some of which are just objects. But as it happened to me, And I teach this now as one of the central ways to find this kind of awakening. I said I was sleeping. And I believe I had slipped from deep conscious unconsciousness into a dream. And then I woke up. And I made the transition without any change in me. That is dream consciousness, deep sleep consciousness, and awake consciousness made no difference to how I felt. I was independent of these three states. They came to me, so to speak, and I was not really touched by them. What I was, whatever I was,
was not touched by consciousness or anything in consciousness. I was not touched by nothingness or anything in nothingness. In this place, I could not be called either nomina or phenomena. Waking consciousness, sleep consciousness, nothingness was like an object to me. and didn't touch me. And I saw this later on in many, many different awakenings and mornings. At first I was in deep sleep. And I would see within a rising light. At this point there was no thinking There was only you know, an awareness of the rising of light within. There was no mentation about what that meant. There was no thinking. There was no saying, ah, that's light arising. But after a certain point of it arising within, when it reached about the heart level, I knew, but without words, that I was about to wake up to waking consciousness. And a little more, this light arose within me. And if I had my eyes open, I could see things, but my mind was not there. And although I was seeing things, I didn't know what they were, or nor did it occur to me that this was an unusual state. This is what Robert calls the gap. There's perception and awareness but without recognition of any entities or my own existence even. There was just awareness. There was objects, but they didn't point themselves out as objects. They were part of a totality, I guess. But at some point, suddenly, almost like a sledgehammer. It came to me that I was awake in my room on a bed and I could begin to hear things and see things and think. It hit me what I had to do today what I didn't have to do. And now that I'm retired, this kind of recognition hardly ever hits me anymore, what I have to do that day, this day. But I know it's day, I know I'm waking up, I know I have a body. But the sure knowledge hit me that this consciousness arose in me out of nothingness, out of darkness, out of a place beyond consciousness altogether. And in a sense, the consciousness was not me because I feel it doesn't touch me. It arose within me in a sense a lot like a fart. And I don't identify with myself as being a fart. This thing arose within me in the same way as something alien, not disappointing or not fearful, but something that arose in we a lot as the gap, which is just light. 
arose out of the dark dampness of the all peaceful sleep that I was in. And it arose out of this dark swamp of peacefulness. And then at a certain point, the gap disappeared and I became Ed Musica in a bedroom with walls, ceilings, etc., and sounds and smells and tastes and touch with the recognition that I had come alive, I had come awake. But I saw that first consciousness arose out of this dark nothingness. And then came awareness of body-mind. Then came awareness of body-mind. So, that which is primarily me is awareness of waking up out of dark nothingness. And then at a certain point, having mind enter which creates a world, the world of my bedroom, my bed, my body, and the rest of the day proceeds with me as this body that came out of nothingness along with, actually came out of consciousness, which came out of the nothingness that I was, and this happens every morning, so to speak, in case I slept during the night. And I sub subsequently saw this time after time after time. At the beginning of the day, my body and consciousness arose out of the darkness the swamp of nothingness. And at the end of the day, my body and consciousness disappeared once again and settled into that dark swamp of peaceful nothingness. I saw, in a sense, that I was like a seed of consciousness that emerged out of nothingness and created the world. And there were billions and trillions of creatures around me that did the same thing and which I became aware of, like Kali. And because it's consciousness, I loved it. I love consciousness. I love my own consciousness. I want to live forever. I wanted Kali to live forever. And when she died, it broke my heart because my best friend had gone from my consciousness. And yet I didn't feel the same at the end of the day when I lose my own consciousness to the dark swamp of nothingness. such as life. Once you're awake into the life force, you want to always be awake in the life force. Yet every night, 
you get tired and you relax your grip. Unconsciousness and consciousness. First, your body sinks into consciousness and then consciousness sinks into nothingness. The darkness of nothingness and you don't fight it. It feels wonderful to be sleeping or to slipping into nothingness and to be nothing. But this transition, when you become aware of it, first thing in the morning, being in nothingness, then watching consciousness arise within you, and then watching your body and your mind arising within consciousness makes you realize that you're separate from both your body and consciousness and nothingness. You're the observer that can watch whatever you are disappear into nothingness and you can look into nothingness, into the darkness and feel the peace. And you can also look into the darkness and see the arising of consciousness from within. And then have that gap of being awake and aware, but not being able to name anything because your mind is not there. Your mind hasn't created the world yet. And then suddenly, like a hammer blow in the brain, the totality of the world appears along with your body. And you are now in the waking world. You are now in either the mundane world of the unenlightened or the divine world of those who have been totally awakened, both to the Shakti and to nothingness to the source from which you come. And that's all that there is that I know of. There may be states beyond what I've witnessed. I'm sure there are. But I can only tell you that the key to the nothingness awakening lies in becoming aware of the birth of consciousness each morning. <laughs> and you're arising out of the arising of consciousness from nothingness as a body and as a mind and with that, the simultaneous creation of the world. Because there comes a time when you've mastered this arising and you can go back and forth between being awake and being sound asleep and watching yourself arise out of that and being awake and then going back to sleep. You just stay on the edge and you play with it going back and forward, and you see that you're separate from both the nothingness of sleep and the consciousness of the waking state, whether it's of the divine consciousness or the mundane world that you wake up into. Now, after Robert left and I had that experience of waking up and moving and not being touched by the arising awakening state or the sleep state or the dream state, finding them all just happening to me. I still had not found the divine world. 
So I would wake up to the mundane world of my everyday world, pre-God. And for there I was for almost 15 years before I had that awakening to God within, to the life force within. And after that, everything changed. I can't tell you which is more important, but both are important. And I guess depending on who you are and where you are in your spiritual development, you'll have one awakening before the other. And if you're very lucky, you'll have them both at the same time. But please know, these two states do exist. Unity with God or awareness of God within. And also the recognition that you lie entirely outside of that dichotomy of waking and asleep, being asleep. The activities of consciousness or unconsciousness. You are beyond even that God realization state. But without the appearance of some sort of consciousness or unconsciousness that you're aware of, you don't even know you exist. It's the arising of consciousness in you that you witness which makes you realize that you're separate from it because you feel like you're separate from it and you can watch it grow and flower. You can watch it arise as light out of the darkness in the center of your being and then become awake to the world, to the conscious world, to existence. And then you can watch your body mind arise out of that gap consciousness and suddenly you realize where you are. You fall into that world of concepts that has constructed the existential world, a world of stories, a world of ever flowing and changing temporality of phenomena. And you realize that what you are is not temporary, but it feels like it's temporary because the phenomena keep changing, but you have nothing to do with the phenomena. Your body is phenomena, it's not you. Your mind is phenomena, it's not you. You're beyond both, but you've learned to identify with it because you don't know yourself as separate from it. And that's it. That's the totality of what I know. And I'm telling you, there is a way, an easy way towards both God realization, which is total love and total surrender which creates the conditions ripe in you for the opening of your heart until you become total love. And after you become total love to realization of God within. And there's an easy, easy, easy way to realize yourself as nothingness. And that is to become aware of what it's like to really wake up in the morning. And I know you may think it's impossible. You've tried it 10 times or 100 times to become aware of your waking up, but you always realize afterwards that you're already awake and you missed the process of the awakening of yourself. You realize, damn, I was trying to be aware of the awakening process, but here I am awake and I missed the process. Well, you can program yourself 
to be awake in the morning. All that you have to do is sort of make it a priority to be awake or be aware of the awakening process. And you may think it's impossible to do that because how can you do anything in the sleep when your mind isn't there? Well, your mind can be programmed to do things even while you're unconsciousness. And one of the things you can do is to make it a point to try to be aware before you awake. And to put yourself in a place where you can watch the process one time and then many, many times. You just make a commitment. It's like if you've practiced meditation long enough, you know that if you practice a certain kind of japa or repetition of a mantra, awareness of, or of an awareness of a certain aspect of consciousness, if you're doing that, going into sleep and you go into sleep repeating the mantra in the morning when you wake up, you'll be repeating the mantra. In the same way, you can set the agenda for yourself to be aware of the process of waking up, but desiring to be aware of what it's like to wake up. And for a hundred times, it may not work, but eventually when you're least expecting it, it'll happen to you. I guess this is the key to an experience where you realize that you are, you exist prior to consciousness and unconsciousness both, nothingness. They are both witnessed by you. So now you know the keys to realize God consciousness. You need to be filled with love. You need to be able to surrender to somebody or something, whether it's a guru, a lover, or a colleague in your life. <laughs> and the key to realizing yourself as prior to consciousness is watching the process of waking up or going to sleep and re-entering the darkness, having consciousness sink into the darkness and be aware of its sinking. And by being aware of its sinking or its arising from darkness, you're aware that you're watching the process and you're neither the darkness nor consciousness. And that it's out of consciousness that your body is born. It's only when you, when you fully wake up that you're aware of your body and your mind. So first, you're resting in sleep, so to speak, enjoying the peace of being asleep in sleep into nothingness. And then you notice somethingness or consciousness arising within, giving birth to consciousness as a human being somewhere about the time that consciousness enters the heart chakra and then rapidly expands from the heart into being a person with a body that's self-aware and having passed through the process of being sleeping in awareness and then being aware of the waking process. 
And then you have to learn how to watch the process of waking up or going to sleep repeatedly at will. And then you've got it. Sita is loudly snoring now. She's over in the corner of the tree, that tree up there. All righty. That's all I have to give today. Are there any questions or comments? Good morning, Ed. Hi. Um, this, this morning I had some aspects of what you're describing. I was, I came from a dream into the realization that I had been dreaming. Uh, there was an awareness of that process. And then I became aware of being awake. In the background, there was this mind saying, I'm supposed to be doing something with this awareness, or there's something else to it, because it all felt it all felt very ordinary. In other words, I guess it's a bit like you described, being asleep and being awake didn't seem to be different at all. <laughs> and then I just went into my day. Um, is that what you're talking about? Exactly so, exactly. Oh yeah, there's more to it. Exactly, <laughs> there's more to it. The, uh, the thing is, it doesn't get more sparkling or energetic or anything like that, but become more and more aware <clears throat> that you're the witness of this, that you're not consciousness and you're not the dark emptiness from which consciousness arises. And it's like a matter of factness that this is all, you might say, imagination. The whole thing about being alive is like imagination. It's created really by the mind that fills out a world after the mind appears. And you've watched the mind appear out of the darkness and out of consciousness, and you recognize that the whole world that exists is a projection of this combination of consciousness and mind. And that in a sense, it's just a dream, a conscious dream. And then when you realize that, the world doesn't take you that much anymore. You know that you're beyond the world. You're beyond existence, and existence is only a temporary state. So you're less moved by it, and you begin recognizing that everything you think during the daytime is part of this process of the mind making up a world and judging a world and being frightened by the world or being taken in by the world and attracted by the world. It's also a play of mind. And you are prior to mind. The, the mind is nothing compared with what you are, which is entirely beyond the mind and beyond consciousness. So you get aware of yourself, as the philosopher Spinoza might say, subspecie eternitas, under the aspect of eternity. And you begin identifying with that background of the immutable, unmovable self upon which this whole show of consciousness and unconsciousness lies. And in a sense, you, as this Im imperial God within, watches the coming and going of the universe, including that God realization state, that's the epitome of the conscious awareness. 
you're greater than God in a sense, because God comes out of you. Does that shiver your timbers? Quite. Not sure I would have used that particular language, but yes. <laughs> it makes it hard on those few days when three days when I have to set the alarm because I get up so early for work. The alarm stops the process from happening, but it is what it is. Thank you. Ed. When can you retire? Or will you, <laughs> or will you ever I be retire. able to? I have no idea. At the moment, I can't foresee it. I retired um, in 2004, and you see where that got me. I, uh, I thought I was done, and then I discovered it was financially impossible, and so I've been working ever since. It'll happen at some point, but uh, it'll be outside of my conscious intention right now. Forces other than I'm aware of are going to have to enter in there. But now, with this understanding, or the beginnings of this understanding, you can relax to that, recognizing even that's just part of the play, although it's an uncomfortable part of the play. Nothing made me more happy than to ha not have to do psychiatric reports anymore, where I had to do a, a, a full-scale rebuttal of an enemy psychiatrist evaluation of my patient. Yeah, that's it is nerve the, wracking. Uh, the, the documentation is a real pain. It interferes with it, with everything, and it's part of the game. So, yeah. Well, thank you. In in my profession, which was workers' comp, yeah. we have opposing forces. The plaintiff, which is the employee that's injured, his doctors, including his psychiatrists, and then the psychiatrists and the doctors that the companies hire or the insurance company hires and who finds out there's really no work connection to whatever damage they've suffered. It's either pre-existing or some sort of weakness in them that was pre-existing. And I have to prove that it was the company and the injury. And they go out of their way to lie and lie and lie and lie and just say it's pre-existing or there's no case here whatsoever. And it's upon me. And I relied a lot upon objective testing because objective testing has no sense of subjectivity into it, even though I can read all kinds of things into it that I want to, if you really know what testing is about. And that was my primary weapon, but it required a lot of thought and intense concentration, which I didn't like because it took me out of my relaxed state of nothingness. Yeah. Rather than relying on objective testing, which I really don't use, I rely upon my ability to read the judge and speak <laughs> to that judge and whatever comes of it comes of it. But that's my particular way in. I understand that, but I never had to represent a client in court. I just wrote the papers in the background. I made you look good. <laughs> because you could always rely on me to lie for you or to put our position yes. forward. Absolutely. Thank you, Ed. Oh, you're so welcome. Anybody else? Are you, by the way, are you satisfied with your progression now in the last month or so of unfolding? Of your You're understanding. asking me, Ed? What? You're asking me? You're yeah. asking me? Yes. Um, yes. Yes. There are definitely mornings when I wake up and the first hour, hour and a half are very contracted. And uh, it takes me a couple hours to kind of 
let that pass and to do some clearing of some emotion or it's just a dullness and that's annoying. But other than that, I can feel there's definitely progress, um, movement. As long as I set aside any uh, interest in bells and whistles, then yes, there's definite progress. Good. Veselina, is there any movement in you? Yeah, yeah. Mm. I'm upset. I'm very upset. What are you upset about now? What did Michael do? Nothing. I had a family meeting. Uh. Um, I didn't like uh, for something that somebody says and I don't have a reaction right away, but uh, I get a sense of uh, what they were actually telling me behind their words. And then after some time, I have a very strong reaction sure. on the inside. And I'm like, why do I have it so late? Now I cannot make <laughs> a big fight. I can't, I missed the time to say something horrible to them or to just defend myself. And now I just have to deal with it on my own. That's all right. You'll get to the point where you're able to realize these things more quickly. By the way, uh, just as I'm going to toss this out. My personal understanding is that uh, Veselina wrote me that she really, really loves Michael despite all of his faults. And she sort of likes him because of the faults, but she did emphasize his faulty nature, but that she accepts it and loves him. I thought that was so sweet. But that's new for me. So I still haven't have to see it work in real life yeah okay anybody else wants to say anything hello ed so hi mark how you doing sir how's your health good good so a couple of thoughts um despite all the obstacles and hardships that i endured which i'm sometimes vocal about in my life it appears that in my spiritual journey, I, I've been very fortunate because as soon as I started here, I realized that what I was encountering was what you call divine energies. And my whole spiritual unfolding continues four years later to be the unfolding of the spiritual energies, which began as a little like pinpoint or a little bit flashlight. And now it's kind of like a halo that's illuminating my uh, subtle bodies. I can feel beingness right now superimposed on my mundane self and i'm i realize i'm beyond both but there's a detachment from the beingness the bliss and the expansiveness and the dreamlikeness of the beingness being there automatically like the embers are fanning and that bliss just extends into into whatever into space into uh, into existence and it's wonderful um so thank you for that and my unfolding i'm very satisfied with it i've done my part i continue to do my part but it's 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 unfolding nicely for me even after four years um i thought about what you were talking about uh about um not being touched by the different states and upon waking real uh being aware before the waking state experiencing the waking state well so far, I've been unable to do that because when I wake up from sleep, I wake up suddenly. I have a very hyper nervous system and it may take me longer or it may not be possible for me, but I can tell you what I can do. When I go into meditation, when I go into the depths of beingness, I can go into the beginning of sleep while still being awake. So I experience, I know I'm there because I start experiencing dream. I see like usually crowds of people or some kind of scene. It's very complex. It arises spontaneously out of nowhere, all by itself. 
really real, but kind of like see-through because I'm not fully in the dream state, but I can go into that beginning of the dream state and then come back out. So that's that kind of stuff I can do right now. Good for you. Yeah. My problem was that when the recognition that I was separate from my body, consciousness, and sleep, and dream, that happened to me in, oh, maybe March of 1995. No, no, it's later than that, December, because Robert left in September to go to Sedona, and it was a couple months later. But at that time, I had not experienced God realization. So even though I recognized I was separate from my mind, my body, I would always come back to the mundane world. And the mundane world was not conducive in any way to happiness. I couldn't say that I was depressed for the 15 years after that, but I didn't feel much about it one way or the other. But after I had the God realization experience of the life force within me, every time I woke up in the morning, there was the rush of joy of being alive and feeling the energies and feeling the life force and the companionship of the life force because the life force seemed like an entity to me. And it loved me and I loved it. So that was a big change. It's only now in retrospect that I see different processes going on and I'm satisfied with it and with my state and where I'm going and all of that. I'm not to the, a place where Nisargadatta is, was, where he was just tired of li living and he can, couldn't wait to die, but he wanted to die peacefully. I still find a lot of happiness and unhappiness, both in the external world, like my life with Kali while she was alive for 15 years. And now I feel the heaviness of her death because I love life. And Nisargadatta, by the time he was ready, he wasn't loving life at all anymore. He just wanted to get out of it in the least painful way possible. Anybody else? Isn't isn't that a little bit discouraging? I mean, what? But isn't this a little bit discouraging? The fact that uh, most gurus just want to get out of this trap of uh, samsara, and I that's my main difficulty. You know, sometimes I feel like that. Other times I enjoy life as well. Why are we here? <laughs> I mean, if, it's, if it is a trap, if it is samsara, is it just uh, uh, an exercise? Is it, uh, is it, a, is it a, sat a satsang? Is this like a satsang that you have to uh, just understand that everything is uh, a virtual reality? 
that's the one question. And the second question is, I get uh, the training of yourself into being in the gap. And I've experienced it myself. I, I had glimpses of it. What I can't uh, force myself to do is finding love. I mean, loving everybody. Having love in your heart is something that I can't train myself to do. And as you said it, uh, being in the gap and loving, uh, it reminded me of Krishna Das when she went to Nim Karoli Baba and she thought I should ask him something about Christ. And she asked Nim Karoli Baba, how did Christ meditate? And Nim Karoli Baba became silent for a few seconds and he said a tear and he said uh, he, he, lost his, he lost himself in love. And that's the one question, how do you lose yourself in love? Well, I don't know. It just happened to me. I, without expecting it, it came out of nowhere because of a person that came into my life. I couldn't exercise that. I couldn't practice being deeply in love. It just happened when the time was right. 15 years after I found nothingness, and being locked in nothingness was uh, perhaps a pressure cooker for the life force breaking out. I don't know. I have no answer for what you're asking. It's not, uh, it's beyond my pay grade, as they say. You can find all kinds of answers in Eastern philosophy about God and about the one entity that is the subject of all. But to me, that's just philosophy. I'm not bothered by not having love because I, I feel it all the time. And that's what you have to deal with is feeling the love within. And I found it by loving from without and becoming so filled with love for the other that I suddenly saw one day that all my love for her was in me. I created it. She was just the trigger. And then after that, I found out that I was love all the time. I created it, not her. I created it by loving and by, by surrendering to her. So maybe you can do the same, but you can't do it by deliberately trying to do it. I don't believe in that, that you can continually just force yourself to love and that becomes real. I think these things have to hit you like lightning out of the sky. Good luck. Kevin, do you have anything to say? Eddie, do you have anything to say? Um, I got to put more emphasis on the gap state for like the waking. Um, I've, I've, I've done it like a couple times, but I need to focus up again to making that more of a priority. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy you talked about that today and the importance of it. Thank, thank you. Sure. You're welcome. By the way, I understand that uh, the Moderna booster may be available at the end of the month for us who have taken the Moderna. And I'm not letting anybody come here until I get my booster because uh, this new variant has been killing a lot of people and my lungs are very, very weak. And I don't dare get anything 
too severe happening to my lungs because I want to stay alive right now. I don't want to go. Let me see this. Hold on a second. <clears throat> 